Hello, hello. My name is Nemo, Nemo Filipovic, and I am the lead artist over at Prodigy. Today, I want to draw for you. I want to draw two of my favorite characters. One of them is Squally, and the other one is Luminite. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these characters and break them down to their absolutely most basic shapes and go from there. Everything is easier to draw if you start by breaking it down to its basic shapes. And to make it more interesting, I'm going to draw Squally digitally, and I'm going to draw Luminite traditionally. All right, let's get started. Reference images are important. You cannot remember everything you need to remember about something to draw it well. Some people can, but they have to be really, really familiar with that subject, with what they're drawing. Like a person who's around flowers all day probably knows how to draw flowers very well if they do art as well. So if you're playing the game, if you're playing Prodigy the math game, then you may already know how to draw these characters, which is good, but you may also need a picture to help you with some of the details. Fantastic. The quickest way to gather reference for your drawing is to play the Prodigy game and take a screenshot, either on your computer, on your, on your uh, phone, or on your tablet. So that's one way. The other way, of course, is to use an image search engine on the internet by typing in the words Luminite, uh, Squally, Prodigy, or whatever else you're looking for. Okay, now that we have our reference images for Luminite and Squally, we're going to discover what basic shapes make up their whole bodies. In art, we call this doing a breakdown. It's where we divide complicated forms into their simpler shapes so we can draw them more easily. Squally is definitely the easier to break down of the two. The shapes for this character are very, very simple. It seems to be a large circular head area, which is good. Very, very simple to understand there. And then at the bottom, there seems to be these three little spikes, but they're not really spikes because in the Prodigy style, we try to avoid very, very sharp, sharp, sharp objects. It's just not friendly and it's not the look that we're going for. In the end, after you have these two, you can see that together, they make kind of a teardrop shape, which is good to keep in mind their relations to each other. Furthermore, it seems that the circle on top is actually taller height-wise than this piece at the bottom. So it's not perfectly even on top and bottom side. It looks like there's more to the head part than there is to the body part, which is good. That makes it uh, easier for us to figure out their relations to each other. It's important to understand that not everything is the same size and you have to fight the urge to draw it that way. The least you can do to make your drawing interesting is to find the large, medium, and small shapes and put them in your drawing. What we're going to do then is I'm going to take these pieces and I'm going to move them off to the side. So there's that one there. And I'll just redraw the part at the bottom. And I will move that over to the side as well. We'll keep these in mind for later. Now, let's go to the rest of it. This character seems to have arms. If I took a look at these arms over here, that's interesting. And if I do the same thing around here where I go around their shapes, one of the things I'm starting to realize is that they're not perfect circles either. It seems like we've repeated the teardrop idea. It's bigger at the top than it is at the bottom, which is also fantastic. One other thing you may realize is that the arm that's farther away from us in the back here is slightly smaller than the one in the front. That's because this character, when they tried to draw it, they were trying to get a sense of perspective as well. This is good. Gives the idea that it's a three-dimensional form. Let's move these off to the side so that we can keep them in mind as well. One thing that is very important to keep in mind, however, when you're drawing these characters is the three-dimensionality of it. This may be too advanced for some, but it's good to keep it in mind even at this stage. What you're seeing here is not necessarily a circle. It's a sphere. There is a round form going around this whole piece. It's a three-dimensional object. And it appears like the center of the face being here. And here, we can start seeing how the actual features align with each other. So it seems that we have a square here. That's very good, very easy for us to understand. In this square, all the facial features are going to be aligned to each other in some way. So if I actually try to divide this square in the middle of it, you're going to see that the eyes go slightly lower than the middle. 
Okay, good. So in that case, we could put our dividing line there. So the top third is eye, and then the lower third is the mouth. The mouth itself also seems to be just uh, this normal curved U-shape, wedge shape. Fantastic. Notice it does not spike at the corners either, so we keep that same rounded aesthetic. And the eyes just seem to be two sets of circles, normal, with the smaller set a bit inside. Okay, now that we have this set up, we know what to do when it comes time to draw Squally for real. Beginning the drawing of Squally now, I have a tablet, I've got the pen, and I'm doing it digitally, which means I'm doing it directly into the computer. And note also that I'm starting off the drawing the same way that we discussed, with those same basic shapes we discovered. There's the large head, there's the smaller body with the three sort of spikes, they're just blunted out. Now I got the teardrop shape happening for the, for, for the front arm, and I drew those very light lines which I then erased to figure out how much smaller the back arm is going to be compared to the one in the front based off of perspective. This is good. I'm also then going to go over some of the lines, the ones I'm committing to, and I'm thinking to myself, are these proper? Are they getting the right shape? This is the push and pull stage. You see, there are parts where I may have the right proportions, but maybe it's not a perfect circle in the head. Maybe it's wider to the top right or flatter on the back or something. And I'm going back and forth across those. Here, of course, I'm also putting in the details of the teeth. As you can see, I ran a center line down the center of the face and we're progressing, trying to get every feature. As I'm drawing, I'm comparing the shapes that we discovered before to each other. I want to make sure that those eyes are in the same size, that they're the same size compared to each other, but also compared to the head, compared to the teeth, and on and on and on. This character I'm pretty comfortable with, so it's going to go pretty fast. Essentially from here, I'm just tweaking. I may be shading in some areas to try to see if I got the contrast right, but more so than not, the pencil stage is done. Maybe I'm thinking to myself, checking, double checking shapes, double checking sizes, but very soon you're going to see that I'm going to transition to the inking phase. Now we've entered the inking stage. What this stage is, is you're doing the cleanup. You're taking a different brush, one that's darker, one that's uh, more solid, and you're trying to go over your drawing in as clean lines as possible. This is going to take a lot of practice, a lot of work, and as you're about to see, I don't always get it in the first shot. So that time I didn't get it. So what happened was I hit Control Z and I got rid of that line and I tried it again. You're going to see me do this over and over and over again. It's not important to get it perfectly the first time. Absolutely not. What it is is that you can see, you have to develop the ability to see that what you put down isn't quite right. You change the shape of the figure because you went too far to the left, too far to the right with your line. And once you notice that you did that, you hit the undo button. It's different for every program, but it's usually control Z on the keyboard. And then what ends up happening is you do it again. There's no reason to not try it again. It's digital, it doesn't take a very long time and nobody needs you to be perfect. Here on the mouth, I have a different strategy. I understand that those uh, that those darker areas uh, you know, in the mouth and the teeth, the separations between the teeth, they don't have that connecting line all the way to the top to the bottom. But to make sure that they line up properly, I came up with the idea of first making the outline and then, as you can see now, I'm erasing the pieces in between. That's how I keep them the same size and make it look like they flow into each other. These are the tricks that you can learn when you're working digitally. They're not available to you always when you're working traditionally, although I suppose it is possible at this stage if you were using a pencil to draw the line and then erase in between. There are some advantages to working digitally, some advantages to working traditionally, but this here, this technique you're seeing, is one of my favorites to make sure that the line work is nice, crisp, and connecting, even if it breaks. 
What you're about to witness in this section is me doing the eyes and the circle around the eyes an unbelievable amount of times. I, for some reason, just couldn't get it and it didn't look very, very refined. So I had to do it over and over again. And as you see, I had to tweak this corner. I think I went back and erased that eye I just put down because I realized it didn't work with the one I'm about to lay down. And yeah, as you can see, that's lopsided. That's no good. <laughs> There's so many mistakes I made during this drawing, but I'm happy because I worked through it. That's the most important thing. You work through the drawing and you, you make it work in the end. It's not a matter of getting it right the first time. It's a matter of being resourceful, learning from it, and you just keep going until you get it. It's time for the color stitch. First thing you do here, if it's a white character like this and you can't see what you're doing on the white background, is you make the background gray. It only makes sense because you can't see what you're doing if it's a white character, white background. Then what I did was I took the eyedropper tool. That's a tool that's available in most digital drawing programs. And I sampled the color from the reference picture to put in my own drawing now. It's now the exact same color because that looks like white, but it's not actually completely white. It's some type of a very, very close blue cream color. And I wanted to make sure that I got the exact right tone. So I sampled it. A nice advantage working digitally. You do not have this capability working traditionally, but there is a way to make sure that your colors are close. I'm going to talk about that when we do the Luminite drawing. So now we've entered the shadow stage. This is essentially where I put in the shadows. I think about where the light source is coming from and I make sure that the shadow is on the opposite side of that. Here, if the shadow is coming, sorry, if the light is coming top down, then I have to put the shadow on the bottom because that's the part of the character that doesn't face towards the light. It's very simple. The other part to keep in mind is that when I'm putting down those shadows, I don't just put a straight line across the body. I curve it and specifically, I curve it to follow the form. Now that I'm finished with the actual shadow work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start filling in the colors for the other areas. This is the pink of the eyes, the dark blue that's between the teeth, and the dark blue that's on the outside of the eyes as well. Squally is starting to look a lot more like Squally, but there's still something missing. And it's probably the fact that the line work is still solid black. At Prodigy, we don't do that. What we do is we put color into the line work as well. That means the outlines as well as the inlines. To get those colors here, again, is digital. We're just going to sample from the reference and we're going to make the colors match. Squally's looking pretty good, but there's still a little bit to do. What we have to do is make sure that the internal lines are just a bit brighter. So I'm going to sample here from the finger and I'm going to make this match. It's important that the internal lines are just a bit brighter than the outside. We're going to do it here and we're going to do it on the other side. And that way Squally is going to be exactly Prodigy. Okay. Now that the drawing is pretty much finished, I'm just going to take a little bit of time and I don't have to because at no point did we ever need this drawing to be perfect. I'm just going to take a little bit of time to do some cleanup. I believe that some of those lines around the mouth could be a little cleaner. I'm just going to take my time and I'm going to go in and do that. So here I am at the cleanup stage at the very end, very happy with the drawing, continuing it, very much enjoying the whole process. And there we have it, a finished picture of Squally done totally on computer. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining me. 
Before we begin breaking down Luminite, I want to introduce a very, very simple concept when it comes to creating interesting shapes. There is a shape in art, especially cartooning art, that repeats itself over and over and over. If you think about the letter D, you have a straight side and you have a curved side. Okay, very, very good, easy to understand. What we don't want, however, is this D to be completely even at the top and at the bottom. You see here how it's the same size at the top and at the bottom? We don't want that. What we want to do is we want to choose what side we put the focus on. So we have a D that's like this, where it's heavier here, there's a bigger bulge on the top right corner. Or we have it like this, where there's a bulge at the bottom right corner. Notice also that this can go here, that this can go here, and that you can even put the straight line in any angle you want to draw that shape. This type of bulging D, this dynamic D, I'm going to call it, is a shape that, again, is very common in art and cartooning, and you're going to see it all over this character. We're going to get to that right away. Can you see in Luminite where that shape is present? I see it here in the front leg. You have a straight, pretty much a straight, there's still a bit of a curve, but you can see that there's this big bulge to the bottom left corner. And that's the main shape of this front leg. Now, Luminite's other leg there in the back can also be seen to have that same shape. Note that if you try to draw the paws, it's the same thing. There's like a straight and a D that's like it's on its back, but the bulge is at the top and at the front. Okay, very, very good. Can this shape be seen anywhere else? Yes, it can. It can actually be seen, it can actually be seen in the body as well. So everything from the front chest area to the back pelvis area, as we call it in anatomy, but enough of that, just the lower body, can actually be broken down into that shape or described into that shape, the D that has emphasis on one side versus another. Lastly, that shape can also be found in the tail. It's like a straight, and curved with the bulge being here. Actually, I would do this one a little differently. I think this is a lower bulge. Ah, much more accurate. See, I got it wrong the first time. Now, let's go to the head. The head does not follow that same D shape. The head is more of a football shape, which is kind of blunted on this side, but it pulls out on this side. Okay, the ears can be described as these simple triangles. Very, very nice. Notice also that these are not spiked triangles. They're still curved at the top here, blunted at the top, just like we had on the shapes that you saw in Squally, no difference. And note finally that I didn't draw the ears stopping here. I actually drew the part of the ear that you can't see. This is actually something in art we call drawing through because it allows us to overlap the shapes the way they actually do in real life. Because an ear, goes into the person's head. It's part, it's attached to the person's head. And same thing on a wolf or on a dog and on Luminite, as you can see here. The last interesting shape that we want to talk about on Luminite before we get to the details of the facial features are in this back leg. This back leg is not a D. It's actually a bit of an S curve. It's a backward S curve. So if you just keep in mind that S curve and then you complete the tube around it, you have the leg. Finish it off with the D shape that's in the paw. Now let's take a closer look at Luminite's face. We want to see how the eyes, the nose, the teeth, we want to see how it all works together. So let's bring back that football shape that we established before when we were breaking down the whole body. And again, we want to think about this three dimensionally. So I'm going to try to draw a center line going down between the eyes. And I'm going to try to make that follow the form. What I mean is when you take a look at this nose, it looks like the nose center 
is not in the same place as the center of the eyes. There's a reason for that. It's because when you think about a dog or a wolf, the nose comes out. It gets pulled out a little bit. So the center line does actually come here and then go over and under. Like that. Or possibly like that. That looks a lot better. If we draw around this nose area, now we're starting to see this breakdown. It's a football shape. And then you go to the front middle and you draw the, the muzzle, the top part of the uh, you know, the top part of the mouth. You put the nose in the center, a little bit, a little bit above the center, because here's the center line, so it's actually sitting on the center line. And then of course at the bottom of this muzzle area, you have the little cute teeth that come out underneath it. Lastly, we gotta talk about the eyes. Okay, so evenly spaced from the center line to start. And it appears like they're flat here and curved up. So you kind of have that interesting dynamic D shape in this eye at least. In the other one, it seems like you have it as well, but because of the angle, the perspective of this, of the face, maybe not so much. This one here seems to be more of a, more flat on this side. It's like this eye would be the same shape as this, but because this part of the head is turning away from us, this section that would normally get pulled out is actually coming in a little bit. So the beginning here starts the same way as the other eye, and then here it goes more flat, turning the whole thing more triangular, whereas here it's very clearly that dynamic D shape with the flat side at the bottom, the curved on top, more emphasis happening here. Okay, last thing to know about Lumenite's face and how to draw it is you have to, of course, draw the eyes in here. Now, I think it's time to draw Luminite for real. Before we start drawing Luminite on this piece of paper, I want to talk to you about the tools of the trade. So, firstly, there's a pencil. That's what I'm going to use for most of the actual drawing. I'm going to do the underdrawing, the planning, all of it with this pencil. The type of lead inside this one is F. Artists like to use that because it's something between a hard and a soft. For people drawing this type of drawing where we're planning on coloring it with some markers afterwards and we don't want too much pencil showing through, I either recommend an F or an H pencil. H standing for hard, meaning that not a lot of lead will get on the piece of paper, just enough so you can see. Let me put that away for a sec. The the next important piece of tool that we're going to use is going to be the eraser. My eraser has a lot of marks on it because it's corrected a lot of my mistakes over the years. I'm very happy to use it. And even when my picture is exactly the way I want it to be on this piece of paper, I'm still going to use the eraser to lighten the lines so that I can more easily apply my color and my ink. Speaking of the cleanup stage with color and ink, when we're going to make it really beautiful, really crisp and nice, I should say Say that a lot of artists use black ink to do the line work of a piece. This is normally very good because it's a, it creates high contrast. It's a solid black versus your white paper. Very easy to see, you know, it's, it looks very nice. But that's not the Prodigy style. We create that contrast in a different way. We want our picture to be beautiful, colorful, and we don't need solid black to do it. So I'm not going to use this. What I am going to use is the various colors that I took the time to assemble before I came to you today to draw this piece. I've got the gray for the body, the yellow for the fur, even the red for the eyes. It's all there and the line work itself I'm going to do with a combination of gray and sometimes even brown so that the piece never gets too dark with the line work like I said. In the end we're going to have a beautiful picture of Luminite and it's going to make sense in the Prodigy style. Okay let's get going. As described, we begin the drawing by blocking in those shapes we discovered during the breakdown. I'm starting with the large football shaped head and I'm going from there. The entire time I'm remembering the shape relations. The head is about half the size of the whole body. We said that. The ears are around one fourth, one quarter the size of the head. We said that and so on. Note also that here when I put in the muzzle and the nose, I'm putting it to the forward center of the head, just like we said. The whole plan is being put into motion now. My hand is also going to move in the ways we mentioned. 
I look for that repeating dynamic D shape. I'm looking for that center line and I'm gonna draw it too. There's no reason to try to be clean at this stage. In fact, before we go any further, let's talk about that. Now you may be wondering at this stage, looking at me doing the pencil work, why does it look so dirty? The real reason is I don't care. You see here, that's not the point. Here what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get all those shape relations that we figured out in the previous section and put them in my drawing, put them on the page. The time for cleaning is later. That's why I'm using pencil. I'm going to erase it and I'm going to ink it, clean it up later when it matters. It's around this stage I start to seriously put in the facial features and here is where I put in that center line so I can place the eyes properly. This is always a really good idea when you're putting together facial features and making sure that everything is the right size. You don't want your character to have crooked eyes or to have crooked teeth or anything of that nature. So please don't forget to put down your center line. Here I start to draw in the body. There's not too much to talk about here besides of course following all the same shapes that we covered when we did the breakdown. We have the dynamic D shape in the body, we have the dynamic D shape in the leg and in the toes of the paw which I'm drawing right now. Notice that there's three there at the front but on the back one which I'm going to draw now, I actually only draw two toes at the end. The idea being that the far one is not in view at the moment. Now that I'm close to the end of the drawing, one thing that's really important to remember is that I have a picture of Luminite in front of me while I'm drawing this. I've had it there the whole time and it's going to continue to help me when I get to the coloring part of this drawing too. I never stopped using reference the same way that I used a reference picture the complete way through while I was drawing Squally. I have a picture of Luminite in front of me right now. And after all that drawing, I'm just going to erase it just like that. <laughs> well, the reason why is very, very simple. Like I said, we're going to ink it and we're going to color it. So we don't need these pencil lines there. In fact, if you've got too much pencil on the paper, when you start putting down markers and inks, you can actually smudge the pencil. It's important for you to erase it at this stage. Okay, and now we're at the inking stage. So the marker that I have in my hand is a gray marker because we don't use solid black for line work over at Prodigy. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, yes, stick over the line, but not necessarily too tightly, not go exactly over the line because you still need it to feel like the line has life to it. So I'm sticking close, but not exactly. If my hand has a better flow going a slightly different way, I'll do it. Now, a little explanation that pen that I'm using right now, I know I said I wasn't going to use that pen because that's the pen which I said was solid black, but that pen's very interesting. It has a gray side and it has a solid black side. I am currently using the gray side, so we're not using solid black, don't worry, and I'll show the final image at the end to prove it. Aha, uh -huh. so for the first time, we're going to be doing line work with a color that is not gray. Here I have a brown and I'm doing the toes with this color. Now, why am I doing that? Very, very simple. The reason why is because the color of those toes is actually that yellowy uh, tan color and it's not the same gray that would be seen in the fur of Luminite. So since those paws are a lighter yellow color, it doesn't make sense for their outline to be gray. Their outline should be a darker version of that tone. So if it's yellow, then the darker version of yellow is some type of orange or some type of brown. Now 
now with the line work done, it's time to start with the fill colors. I always go with the most dangerous parts first. I think what you're going to see is I'm going to start coloring the eye immediately. And yeah, the reason why that's a very dangerous way to go about it is because the eyes are the eyes are exactly where people are looking. If you make a mistake here, you go too far, your character is going to look very, very weird, and the picture could actually be ruined in that regard. Me, personally, I like to do the most dangerous parts first, especially when it comes to traditional drawing. In digital art, there is no danger here. If you do it wrong, you just hit Control Z and you go back. But if you mess this up, you may need to use a tool called Whiteout or something to try to fix it. But the chances of it actually being fixed with the Whiteout are not very good. The Whiteout itself leaves a texture and it's normally pretty obvious that there was a mistake. So I did the eyes. There was no error. Very happy that happened. Yeah, just. Whenever there's a part that you're afraid to tackle, I think it's important to just go for it and go for it soon because you don't want to have to do a whole drawing and then mess up on the most important part and then you can't continue. Now that the eyes are finished, I'm actually very confident in continuing with the rest of the piece. That's just how I go about it. I know other people have different methods, but this works for me. So let's talk about color a little bit here. So coloring this picture, I have to say, was quite easy. And the reason why was because I was following that reference. The colors were already figured out. Where do you make something lighter or darker? Where you place yellow? Where you place gray? It was all there. So when you're drawing a picture of Luminite and you're trying to make it exactly like the Prodigy style, you should definitely use that reference. And also the markers that we saw on the left there that I collected before I started my drawing, it turns out they were pretty accurate to the colors that I needed. But I did need to go back and grab a couple of different versions of red. And also I needed to grab a purple to go underneath the feet. Speaking of color, just so you know, it's not always the case that the color that's on the outside of the marker is what's going to appear on the page. Quick word about color. How did I know what markers to use when I was coloring Luminite? Well, the thing is, I actually didn't know. I had a test page, and here I would take the markers and I would try them on the paper to see what color they actually gave me. Just because a color is shown on the outside of the marker does not necessarily mean that that's what it's going to look like on the page. So you test it. Then you can apply it to your drawing with confidence. Anyway, enough about that. Let's just enjoy the coloring for a bit and I'll jump back in later on. So in a moment, you're going to see something cool. There is a type of pen out there, this pen in particular, that has white ink in it. It's like whiteout, but it's the white ink, I think, is a little bit more, it covers, it covers a little better. And so it's really, really helpful when trying to make those white reflected spots in the eyes pop out. And I also use it on the teeth a little bit just to make them look a little bit more white too. Very, very cool. Note here also that I just took that brown and I put it in the dark spots of the eyes and I'm even doing it to make some line work sharper in some areas. What we're doing now in these final stages of the drawing is we're going for contrast. We're really trying to make parts pop. So parts that are supposed to be darker, that are supposed to be more eye-catching. This is where we do that. This is where we make that happen. And uh, I'm going to do everything I can to make the drawing a little bit more interesting. So here I just put a little shadow on the top part of the eye. Why would the top of the eye have shadow? Normally that happens because there's a brow going over it. So we put that there to simulate it. And of course, 
Here, I'm using that purple marker to put a little bit of a round shadow at the base under, underneath the feet. And the reason for that is just to give a sense that the character is standing in three-dimensional space. Notice how when you put that circle underneath, it really makes the character feel grounded, like they're not floating in the air. That's a cool effect. And it's amazing how such a simple thing can have such an effect on the viewer. You look at that shadow and it instantly makes sense to you. That is one of the coolest things about art and making images. You're really creating uh, like a believable reality that people can get lost in, which is so cool. And one of the reasons why I do this job. And I think that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this drawing. And that's it. Thank you so much for being here with me today as I drew. I'm very thankful that everyone's loving the project again. We're very happy to make it for you. We're hoping to keep working on this project for years and years to come. Now, I hope that you learned something today, at least that you can draw anything by taking your time and breaking it down to its basic parts. Simplify, simplify, simplify. It's a good way to go about things, not just drawing. So thank you again, and I'll see you all really soon. Take care, bye-bye.